Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 227 and 228. In these episodes, we meet this admiral who's like very inconsistent with whether he wants to be aggro or not kind of bounces back and forth in a way that reminds me strongly of Luffy, actually. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Florian for commissioning this episode. Um, I think actually this may be... Okay, no, not quite yet. I was going to say, it says Florian commissioned it, but there is a section that Florian is the one who did the booking, but he told me to credit everybody because y'all like pulled together to pay for a big chunk ahead of time. Uh, but we are not quite there yet. That's a little bit further on. But yeah, I am so excited about this weird ass dude that we are meeting. You guys, these episodes are really, really fun. I enjoyed these a lot. Um, and full disclosure, I thought I was covering one piece like a couple weeks ago because I looked at the wrong day. I got my days mixed up and I had watched these already and when it was time today and I was like, all right, what am I covering? And I opened up Netflix and it had jumped ahead for a minute. I was like, wait, what? But yeah, so I've watched these twice now and they were delightful each time. So, my God, I'm sorry. In the chat, uh, Bernadette says, I currently, we were talking about Animal Crossing before starting because Bernadette sent me this lovely like Animal Crossing birthday, sort of like it was a bunch of stationery and, and stickers and stuff. I'm currently trying to make Wardle send me a recycled paper stack and he refuses, which uh, I really want to know what his problem is, Bernadette. So this dude, Gus, it says, I love Aokiji, one of my favorite characters. And please, am I saying that right? I'm trying to do it from memory, but I don't have it down cold. But this guy is full of surprises. So our friends have landed. We start off with like seeing a bunch of people who are peeking at our friends coming up against this very tall man in a clearing. And it turns out that all of these people were like shipwrecked and they were hiding from this dude because they thought that he was going to hurt them when it turns out actually he could have helped them. Now, granted, it becomes quite clear that he isn't really somebody that you can depend on how his, he's going to react to certain things. So... What I mean by that in summary is just I don't blame them for not approaching him. I'm not mad at them for that at all. But I couldn't help but just be like, if you're this desperate, kids, just go to anybody also. Just, just you know, it doesn't seem like you're doing great by yourselves. Um, but the last episode that we broke off on... Robin was absolutely losing her shit when she saw this guy and just seemed shook in a way that we have never seen her lose her cool at all. Like the, the closest we have ever seen is her getting mad that they're destroying the ruins in Skypea. And that was really the only time she's shown an emotion other than being totally chill and placid about whatever is happening. So to see her being this shook is very upsetting. And that's one of my favorite tropes is a character who's normally unflappable getting flapped. 
for lack of a better way to say that. I just always, it really, what it, what it is, is anytime you get to see a character that you know well suddenly act very much out of character. Really, that's always it. I love it. It's, it's number one, probably, in like my favorite tropes list. And number two is when characters have to pretend to be each other so then you have like voice actors or actual like live action actors imitating people that they like work with pretty much <laughs> which i just there there's so many like levels to that kind of joke and i it never gets old to me um so yeah her just kind of freezing up here oh my god i didn't mean to do that i just said it and i didn't mean to do that oh well it said it's out there i already i already put it it's on tape so i'm gonna just go ahead and pretend i did that on purpose um but she says he's only he's one of only three officers in the marines to hold the position of admiral and i love this animation she says this and then we get this like swirly, like deep pink purple background that's almost sort of psychedelic with the marine flag waving on it. And we get the silhouettes of three dudes as she's explaining this. Now, he is Elkiji. We also have the first dude that she says, um, I'm trying to see if his silhouette is telling me anything because I can't recall if we have seen him before. We haven't seen Aokiji before, have we? This is, okay, uh, Akainu and Kizaru. Akainu is looking like he's got a popped collar and a really long coat. And this other guy has like, I can't tell if that's a hat, a really big mustache, hair ears something's coming off the sides of his head genuinely do not know um and she says the only one above them is fleet admiral sengoku who reigns as the top official in the marines that ma that man is one of the three men known as the world government's ultimate powerhouses and so this is basically i think like a bit of a recap of the whole scene that folks were a little disappointed. I didn't quite grasp of, of introducing big players. Um, but let's see. I'm, there's a bunch of stuff happening in the chat chat. Gus says, I don't know if it pops up on screen in the anime or it only appears in the manga, but Aokiji is his code name, which means blue pheasant. His real name is Kuzan. Akainu is red dog and Kizaru is yellow monkey. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Gabriella, I'm here about to drive home. So, uh, so I can't chat, but so excited. Gabriella, I want to say thank you for my little birthday present. I was saying this before the chat started, but uh, I had a wish list on Amazon, guys, and Gabriella got me these like cool earrings and I brought them with me so that I could put them on screen because they're so much bigger than I was expecting. Look at this. Look at these. If you're only listening, you won't be able to see this. So I'm so sorry. But they like touch my collarbone. Basically, they are enormous and I love them and they are way too much and I cannot wait to wear these bitches. So thank you very much, Gabriella, for that. It's so appreciated. <laughs> Yay! Um, Trish says, I believe this is all information that didn't actually get covered in that info dump scene you're referring to. Trish, can I tell you something? I'm really glad to know that because I was like, I kind of covered that info dump twice now. And these still did not ring a bell for me. So I feel better. Good. Thank you. It's just a toss up sometimes, guys, on um, whether my brain has decided to just reformat its hard drive and not remember or whether it genuinely didn't happen. It's just I can't tell sometimes, you know, you got to sort of hope that you're on the right track. Um, at this point, 
at this point, we have uh, every so everybody's standing around listening to her present this whole thing. And um, Usopp is like, why are you here? Why is a guy of this caliber here? He should be focusing on people with several million berry bounties. And I'm like, Usopp, that's y'all. Do you not remember that? You guys are big deals now. Like, maybe not quite a big enough deal for a dude like this, but a big enough deal that it shouldn't come as a surprise that this dude is just, he, like, he's not after you. But if you're going to say that's what he should be doing, he, he is technically. So maybe just don't put that thought into his head at all. Um, so, yeah, and I love in, in the subtitles, it says go someplace else. But in the voiceover with the dub, he like does the this like go away. And it's this afterthought sort of line delivery, which was so funny. There are a couple lines, and I think they're almost all Usopp in these two episodes that had me laughing out loud because the delivery is just so good. Um, so Gus says, Sengoku was covered as far as him being Fleet Admiral. That name I did kind of remember. The guy with the pet goat. Okay, I don't remember the goat. But that's all that was covered. Okay. I did not remember the goat. Noted. Um, so everybody is is checking this guy out, wondering what the deal is. And then he spots Nami. And we get <laughs> we get a moment where I have like that mild embarrassment that I'm watching this show. Owen is getting ready to go to work in the other room. I put the show on. He's got the door open. He had just been on the phone and hung up. So I know that he doesn't have like a, a podcast on or anything. And this motherfucker says, my, 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 here's another sexy lady with huge bazongas. Are you free tonight? And I was like, oh, no. And I could hear Owen cracking up in the bedroom. <laughs> Why? Why do they do this? Why? Uh, and of course, Sanji gets very predictable, uh, protective and calls him a lanky jerk, which I did think was pretty funny. And I should mention that this dude has a sleep mask on throughout this scene. It's like over his forehead, like he just lifted it for a little while. But there is something about everybody being very aggressive with him while he is not only in his like behavior so chill, but literally has a sleep mask on that makes it all so much funnier to me. And he says, I was just taking a stroll, guys, that you don't need to be getting so worked up. And he has a lot of moments where he starts to say something and sort of loses track. Either he can't think of the right word or he sort of loses interest in the sentence. It's unclear which one is happening. There's a, at one point later, he says something about like the amount of money, I think, that he's talking about Robin is worth and he tries to do the math and it just sort of fades away. And he just says, I don't know, some big ass number. And I really related to him a lot in that moment because uh, I frequently will start to be like, I'm just, I'm going to do the math on this. And then I'm like, am I, or am I not going to do that? Let's not do that. How about that part? Um, and the fact that he is just not in command of himself with his language leads to some of them thinking that maybe he isn't who she says. And, all of this is like throughout everybody's yelling at him except for Luffy, who is just staring at him. And for some reason, eventually, Luffy really goes off a little bit later and decides that he is going to like attack this dude. And it's because his and his mentioning of being sort of like after Robin 
even though it doesn't seem like the dude is going to really follow up on that, has got Luffy on edge, I guess. But it was a bit puzzling to me as I was watching Luffy just like lose his shit. And I'm like, why, why did you just wait until he was done with all of his monologuing? Um, so at, in the middle of this, he's like, hey, guys, can you wait for one second? And he literally lays down and is like, hey, sorry, standing up made me kind of tired. Uh, I'm not after you guys. I came to confirm the whereabouts of Nico Robin, who disappeared after the Alabasta incident. And just as I thought, she's with you guys. And it was so weird because he's like, I'm confirming where she is, but I'm not going to try and capture her. I'm not going to actually do anything. I am going to tell them. I'm going to report where she is, but I am not going to take it upon myself to bring her in, even though she's worth all this money. And I was really curious about that. Like, obviously... He isn't an ambitious person. He is too chill. But the fact that he's going to report it, I guess, is really what makes Luffy go off. It's just funny how much he doesn't seem to care about the money. He really genuinely doesn't. Um, so finally, this is when everybody has to pull Luffy off him. And he starts to... Uh, is that happening here? No, it doesn't happen here. My bad. Because there's a moment where he sort of tells them Robin's history. But I thought that happened right here as Luffy was trying to sort of defend her honor. And it, it was a little bit later, it looks like. Um, so, okay, yeah. This is when all of the people who are hiding in the woods come out and are just like, if we knew you were a Marine, we would have come out sooner. And they are all suffering from malnutrition. Some of them are injured. And uh, Chopper is like, all right, I'm going to give them some medicine. And the other dudes go out into the woods and get a bunch of food. And we have Sanji cooking up all of this stuff. And for a bit, everybody seems to be just kind of getting along. And we have a story about how their ship got overturned by a huge frog doing the front crawl that shattered their ship into pieces which we wind up running into later this is so strange I don't know what to make of it I kept thinking it was going to turn out that the frog was a person in like who changes form or something, which is weird because there are so many wild powers in this universe. And we have seen beings who can change from one form to another, like Pierre, who could be a horse or could be a bird or could, a, a Pegasus, I guess. But Pierre could like, could be Pierre like get rid of his wings. I'm trying to remember how he like because he did take more than one form right and then there was the guy who had eaten one of the devil fruits that could turn into a sort of hawk and he were he was the one on alabasta that i had thought was dead but apparently wasn't um so it's not out of the question that that is a possibility but it seems like anybody who can change in that respect tends to be sort of recognizable as partially a person, even when they have changed forms. And that's to say, I know Pierre isn't a person, but Pierre has a consciousness, obviously, and like can interact and understand conversation. And that's made really clear. And this frog, I don't know what's going on with this frog. So anyway, um, the the whole weirdness of this is really set by the wayside when Sanji says what the front crawl but they do breaststroke and I'm like Sanji who even are you and he starts thinking later on about how to prepare frogs to cook 
And I just like stopped and realized I even foods that I'm not really familiar with a lot of the time I'll have looked up recipes just out of curiosity to see what's in something or how it's made traditionally or whatever. And frog is one that I never have. And he says that you have to soak them in white wine to dissolve the mucus. I will tell you something, kids. I am not interested in any food that needs to start with dissolving the mucus. I am, I am just not interested. Thank you. But no, absolutely not. Oh, my God. Like, it just made my skin crawl off my body. No. And that's not to say... I wouldn't actually try them if you put frog legs in front of me because I bet once they're made and they're like crisped up and they smell amazing and you've got a sauce, they're probably great. You know, I bet they taste like fucking chicken. So I've, everything tastes like chicken. But the concept of preparing them and that that being a necessary step, it could not be me. Somebody else has to do it. Thanks, but no. Um. So, yeah, after a great struggle, we were able to make it to this island and we ran out of food and then we saw somebody coming. But when we looked carefully, he was riding a bicycle on the sea. And I really like that the story keeps being punctuated with them being like, what, really? And they say this and Usopp is like riding a bicycle on the sea. OK, that's impossible. And this dude chimes in with, oh, yeah, that was me. And just so casually and nobody like gets a chance to really ask him what that means. But I, it, it, the the fact that nobody is asking, I'm, I just was like immediately I would be like, but OK, hold on. Excuse me. Is it a bicycle, though? And it turns out it is like I, he's fro freezing the water underneath him. But. I would have assumed that it was like one of those land speeder things. What are they called? What is the thing with the Skypea? Not land speeder because it's obviously a cloud thing. Um, but. OK, so Bernadette is saying that mucus bit is weird. During university, I had to dissect them and there literally is no mucus. I'm wondering if it depends on the type of frog, Bernadette. Like. Maybe the ones that are bred to eat, get them? Like, get mucusy? I don't even know. Bernadette says not even their skin is mucusy. Maybe he was thinking toads. They can have weird skin, but they are also not eaten. The muscles and frog legs do look like chickens, though. Yeah, and toads have pretty dry skin. Toads don't really tend to live in water. Like, we have toads just around our house a lot of the time, although less so since we've been getting possums and raccoons. Um... But, I mean, I know that there are some frogs that are sort of mucusy because they stick to things in a way that others don't. But I have always assumed that those were the frogs that were sort of poisonous and that you should not eat. So I don't know. I had trusted Sanji's judgment because, like I said, I have never looked into this. But now you got me real curious, Bernadette. Maybe they're talking out of their ass or maybe it was a bad translation. Um. So... <laughs> again you guys are then uh you know what do you call it uh well and then fades off again and does not finish his sentence and this reminds luffy oh yeah i was going to kick your ass that's right and it aokiji says i was on a stroll i've told you a couple times i am not here to cause trouble and he, he says, um, I'm going to go back. But before that, you guys get ready to depart right away. Fortunately, there's an inhabited island not so far from here. You should get go there to get the treatment you need. And I love Luffy saying, you don't have to listen to this guy. He's a Marine. And there's this long, weird silence. And one of the guys says, so... And Luffy takes a minute of looking really baffled and then is like, oh, right. Usually 
pirates are the bad guys and the marines are considered the good guys huh so you would want to listen to them um and they're asking how can you even help them you don't have a ship and they don't have a log pose anyway how are they even supposed to get to this island and then we get to see what this guy can do so Robin interrupts and says he has the power to make it happen. And everybody goes up against the seashore with this like, it's sort of, what is this? Uh, uh, it's like a raft, I guess, that they're going to drag. A sled? Would we call it a sled? I suppose it is. Um, and at this point, Aokiji is sort of won Luffy over because he's trying to help these guys. So he's asking, what are you going to do? Are you going to swim and pull them or something? Which is really funny because he's just sort of assuming that this dude is way stronger than everybody because of his size, I'm assuming. And I hadn't really stopped to think about the fact that, like, these men all are actually huge. Like the ones in the in the profile uh, silhouette, that's the word I want when Robin is talking about them, they are all of the same height, which is to say like eight and a half feet. They're humongous. And I don't know if that's a product of the devil fruit powers that they have, or if that's supposed to be some like due to something else, or if it's just sort of accepted that like, they are big bads and thus they have to be physically imposing as compared to everybody else. But it really kind of stuck in my head that they are just all apparently enormous. And like Luffy has devil fruit powers, but he's not particularly big. And I don't know if that's just because he's young and these guys are grown men and Luffy's about to grow that big or what, but um, oh, Trish says, just looked it up. Apparently, Aokiji is nine feet, nine inches tall. That is crazy. That's too, that's too tall. It's just too tall. So he walks down uh, towards the water and tells everybody to step back a bit. And he dips his hand in the water, concentrates for a moment and everybody is just watching, like, not even sure what they're waiting for, because he hasn't told any of them what it is he's going to do. And all of a sudden, this creature rears out of the water, this huge sea monster, basically, bright yellow. Usopp says, in the subtitle at least, I bet that's the guardian of this area of the sea, which I found fascinating. That is quite an assumption to make because I didn't know that that was a thing. I didn't know that you would think that that was a thing. And if it is a thing, 100% into it. But I also don't really trust you because you just say things. So, And of course, everybody is sort of expecting that the summoning of this creature is what he is doing. That this is like maybe something that's to do with his power and intent. They're worried about maybe it's out of his control and they start to draw weapons to defend him. And he says Ice Age. And all of a sudden, we see this fog, this cold fog come up and the sea monster freezes, as does all the water, all the water for like miles. It's a huge amount to freeze like this. Genuinely, everybody stopping and staring has, it, it, it has never felt more justified than in this episode. You know, there have been so many moments where we have the slow pan from one character to another to get their expression as they witness great power. And sometimes I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But this is one where I was like, no, this is fair. You guys should stare. This is insane. What? And like, I really love the cold fog that comes off him. 
it comes off him it comes off objects he's frozen and there is just something about the way it's animated that really works and makes me like feel the cold um i just i don't know i, I there are certain things when animated that just really work and some that like you get what it is they're trying to do and it does what it needs doing and that you're aware but it doesn't necessarily viscerally go yeah that's you know what i'm saying and and for this i kept feeling cold like it was a psychosomatic thing um so yeah he freezes this up and walks away and says that'll last for at least a week what a week you froze millions of square feet cubic feet of water hard enough for it to last a week are you kidding me what this is absolutely out of the realm of anything we have ever seen anybody able to do and this dude could not give a shit like he is so he goes and grabs his jacket and is like uh take this pile of food and stuff and go in that direction for four days and you'll get to an inhabited island and he's just saying this like yeah yeah yeah. well you know also, it's probably going to be pretty cold, so you're you're going to want to dress warm. And everybody is still in shock except for Nico, who is – or Robin. I always want to do that. And she is looking really defeated here. There's an, almost an, an, a vibe to her of like, yeah, see, guys, this is why I'm not going to be able to fight back because they can do this kind of shit. And I just felt really bad for her in this moment. There was something like, there was something about how tired she seemed. And considering that we know she has been wanted since she was eight, she probably is really tired. It seems like she's been on the run for a really, really long time. Um, So, yeah, this this is just fucking banana pants and i just nobody can wrap their heads around it one guy is like is this a dream and i'm like genuinely i don't know what i would think i would have to say the same thing is this a dream and uh they're all thanking him and everything but all i could think was one that surface is going to be a nightmare to cross because that water was choppy as fuck when he transformed it. So it is in these huge swells and breaks and everything. And it's just like trying to drag this thing over the ground is hard enough when it's perfectly flat. But that isn't. And it's just it's going to be so hard. And secondly, he's telling them all, well, you know, make sure to dress warm. Like they've got a fucking target they can go to and buy some jackets real quick. There's no Burlington Coat Factory on this island, sir. He they they have what they have. I don't know that there's even some uh, friendly sheep they can shear and spin into some sweaters. That's what they've got on is what they've got on. So, yeah. Uh so yeah, he walks away, everybody likes looking after him, cheering's very excited over all of this. These people are out of the picture. And then we go back to our crew, who is just sort of adjusting to knowing this man can do this. And he is still just sitting on the shore looking really bored, wondering. I They, they all are, are sort of trying to decide how to handle him, I think, because once you know somebody can do this, he seems really intimidating, but he, he just doesn't act intimidating. He doesn't seem to care. So at this point, they're walking up to the shore and he is looking at Luffy and it 
he says something about how he looks really familiar, I think is the line. Uh, and, or no, he doesn't even say anything. He just looks at him weird and Luffy says, what? You're just like your gramps, Monkey D. Luffy. You're free spirited, hard to figure out. And Luffy looks scared. This was something that I found really surprising. So we know the whole thing with Gold D. Roger, right? Is that his name? And the fact that there's clearly a kind of link between him and Luffy. And I'm assuming that's who this dude is talking about. But I was expecting that when he said something to Luffy that Luffy would be like, oh my God, you knew my grandpa. What was he like? I'm thinking Luffy doesn't know his own origins. I've been thinking this entire time because we never get anything about his history that he doesn't know his history. I've just like been assuming this. But the way he reacts here, where he's like sweating and looks really freaked, like this guy's about to blow his cover. And Usopp asks him, Luffy, what's going on? Why do you? And he's like, nothing, nothing. He's so nervous that I'm like, okay, he must know. And for some reason, doesn't want them to know, which I don't really understand why not. Because he, we know he's after the One Piece and that he has sort of like idolized Goldie Roger this entire time. Him being related would only make his obsession in this arena, it would make it make more sense, if anything. And it is just, I, I'm just really surprised at this whole turn. And he says something about... um your grandpa did me a good turn a while back. The reason I came here was to have a look at Nico, Robin, and you. Which makes it sound like his grandpa is either still alive or was alive until very recently. And I was thinking, like, how long ago is it that Goldie Roger was meant to have been executed? And then he says, on second thought, Maybe I should just kill you. The government's taking you guys lightly. But I can see that maybe you're nothing to fuck with. And you might be small, but you've got people who are very good at the things they do all together. And you're, you're starting to look like more of a threat as we uh as as you all grow he says i've been dealing with outlaws for a long time but it worries me to think how you'll turn how you'll turn out um that this is so interesting because what is it that they're protecting exactly even are, do they have the one piece and they don't want Luffy to get it? Do they think that Luffy's going to like run shit? What is it that he, why, what are they threatening exactly? Because it feels like there is something in particular that they don't want this group to like become strong enough to do challenge them. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as that. I don't know, but this is when we get to the whole thing with Nico Robin. And he says the size of her bounty isn't just an indication of her strength. It also indicates the level of threat she poses to the government. And that's why she got a 79 million berry bounty on her head at the tender age of eight. And essentially accuses her of being faithless of being somebody who agreed to be part of whatever crew she needed to be part of to survive 
using people, bailing, not keeping like not keeping promises, not keeping faith, not being loyal and says every group that she has ever been a part of, she is the only one to survive after whatever went down. Everybody in her other groups were all killed somehow and she made it out. So what he's doing here is sort of like trying to put a doubt in all their minds about whether they can trust her. Um, and he says, you guys are all going to regret letting her be a part of this. So it, that's just who she is. There is a clear pattern. And the fact that she always is the one to make it out. I mean, that's does make you wonder, doesn't it? And everybody starts to defend her and says her past doesn't matter. Um, if you're worried about past, I love this Usopp's line. It's a shame that the, the subtitles don't entirely match up because he basically says something like, if I was so worried about everybody's past, how could I be friends with a bunch of fucking nut jobs like these? And just lists off all these like ty the way he describes uh, Nami specifically is I think he calls her a low life or something. It was really, really funny. Um, but the, the thrust of it all is everybody being like the past is the past and you're trying to badmouth her to get to sow discord amongst us and it's not going to work. And he's like, basically, wow, Nico, you really managed to get them all to buy your shtick here. I'm impressed. Like, this is a crew that genuinely got your back. And despite everything, they're still sounding like pretty loyal to you. So I guess you've managed to do it again. Congratulations. And she is looking simultaneously really upset at the way he is characterizing her and really touched at the way everybody else is stepping in on her behalf. Because of course, anytime that people stick up for you, even if you don't deserve it, sometimes even more so if you don't deserve it, it just feels good to have people on your side being defensive of you. And she attacks him using her like uh weird hand power and looks like she pulls him apart into a bunch of pieces. He turns into ice and sort of like all that's left are these chunks of ice on the ground and this fog. But then he begins to reform out of the ice, which is a whole different vibe. This is not a man who is just able to control it. It's like he's made out of it, which is an entirely different level. It just doesn't. I, I don't even know how you would kill a guy who can do this. Like, what method is there? I, I genuinely can't think of any scenario where you take a guy with this sort of power down. Even if you dropped him into like boiling water and tried to boil him, I would imagine he could just freeze boiling water. Probably. I don't know that there's a particular like temperature limit to what he can do. And I mean, could you suffocate him? Maybe. I, I don't know what you do. So she does this too with this. There's a sense of the, like, it almost seems like she already knows that it's not going to work, but she just had to do something. And then you guys, we get kind of the coolest thing. He grabs a handful of grass and he tosses it into the air and breathes out onto the floating pieces of grass, 
which his breath sort of binds to and it becomes a, a knife, an ice saber. And genuinely, that was dope as hell. What? What? I mean, it's just really unfair. This level of power is not fair. What do you even, you know? So the fight begins. And he freezes up everybody's body parts individually. He gets uh, all their like hands and I really appreciate it because I was not sure, you know, the, this show is really, really inconsistent in what it wants to take seriously and what it's going to sort of hand wave and the kind of injury that you sustain if you get frozen like this is a problem. But I wasn't going to be mad if they decided it's a cartoon and we're not going to address what frostbite is. But they do. Chopper is on the sidelines just being like, oh, my God, if we don't treat them right away, their limbs are going to start to rot off. We need to go and do something. And I love Usopp off to the side who's like, he froze me too. And Chopper's like, he did not freeze you. You're just a fucking pussy. Get up and get moving. And Robin comes at him again. And it's so awful he is saying something about how she's going to turn on you all. And she's in the middle of saying, no, I'm not. And I'm going to assume she was going to say, I'm not that person anymore. And he freezes her whole in a pretty fucking brutal moment. Like this is probably one of the more shocking moments for me of just seeing her, absolutely solid ice and how quickly it happens and how sad she is this isn't a regular fight this is him like I won't even say that he's toying with her because it doesn't even feel like it's that intentional toying with her feels much more like you're saying somebody is malicious and sort of enjoying the pain they're inflicting and I don't really get that vibe from him at all but he has clearly like touched a particular nerve with her. So she has a sort of desperation in the midst of her coming at him that isn't usual in the fights that we see. So her getting like stopped in the middle of her sentence when she's like sort of trying to verbally defend herself and also the effects of like the, the, the fog and the way that this looks, I just think it's so effective and everybody staring at this and just like, like literally, what do we do? How do you stop this guy? And he tells them that she isn't going to die. She'll, she'll defrost if you thaw her carefully, unless I smash her like this and then lifts his fucking fist and starts to come and for like just for the for the fun of it which i this is the part where i started to be like wait a second because he didn't seem like he was just mean spirited but then he acts like this and i'm like well maybe he is i don't know um so of course we have uh luffy who manages to like throw himself in the way and pull her downward out of the line of his punch but that just means that he can lift a foot and stomp down on her so he does and then uh, Usopp darts in and grabs her away so that he stomps on Luffy instead and I was so delighted at how quick he goes in there it was just a really like Usopp comes through, you know, it takes a minute. It's hard for him, but he comes through and Luffy says, take her to the ship, save her, treat her. I am going to handle this guy. And he, oh my God, he says something to Luffy because Luffy's like, all right, it's just you and me. We're going to settle this. 
And he's like, all right, well, I'm not going to turn you in for money, though, because I don't have a ship to bring you back in. So I'm just going to kill you, just so you know. And there was something about how completely matter of fact he is with all of this. He's not ever really. There's no menace to his words or his attitude. It's just the way he is that is menacing. You know, his entire being and, the, and his capabilities that is menacing. And then we go to Chopper and Usopp trying to help Robin. And Usopp is so, like, in my opinion, mean to Chopper here. Usopp is yelling because he asks Chopper, like, are you sure this is going to work? And Chopper's like, I don't know because I've never treated anything like this. And Usopp is like, what do you mean you don't know? Her life is depending on you. Like, don't you understand? And I'm just like, of course, Chopper understands. Come on, stop it. And when Chopper like attempts to say, I'm just not entirely because uh, I don't see how it can be possible that she's still alive. Usopp says something like, I don't want to hear it. If you can't do it, then nobody can do it. You're the doctor on this ship. And I was like, there, you're in the middle of trying to do it, Usopp. I don't know what you think you're accomplishing by yelling at Chopper. But honestly, I have pretty much had it with Chopper being yelled at in general. Like, Chopper is the least appreciated and least respected member of the team in my opinion, repeatedly we are seeing Chopper being just sort of left out of the equation. And Chopper isn't a great fighter, but he's certainly capable of very important tasks. And everybody just sort of rags on him all the time. And I'm like, combined with all of the people in authority who were in charge of training him from when he was little being like snotty to him for fucking no reason and gaslighting the hell out of him. Can we like let him have a break, please? Chopper is doing his best. Chopper is harder on himself than any of our crew members. He doesn't need external criticism because he all is only ever criticizing himself when we're in his head, when we're hanging out with him, he is just shit talking himself constantly. That's like what he does. And he doesn't need it coming from his friends. He needs support. He needs positive reinforcement. He needs to be told, we believe in you. We know you can do this. Trust yourself. And I, I just... I don't have any tolerance for it anymore. I'm just saying. So he says, basically, we've got to really thaw her slowly because the instinct that a lot of people have when they get too cold is to plunge themselves into a hot bath. But the actual biology is not, that is not conducive. If you do that, you can actually like really injure yourself. So if you get to the point where you're on the edge of frostbite, you need to do lukewarm water and slowly like bring your temperature up. If you do it too suddenly, you will fuck yourself up. So anyway, um, Luffy is in the midst of this uh, fight with this dude. They're both sailing through the air in the way that people who fight in this universe do he's like doing all of his punchies and it looks like this guy has shattered into a bunch of pieces but then he solidifies back into himself literally with his arms around luffy and completely turns luffy to ice and we just have this like very sad sort of moment with uh luffy's frozen fierce figure and he's speaking to himself and says something about how Nico Robin's going to grow and get stronger and she's eventually going to turn into too much for you to handle. And you guys, he says, I'm trying to find this line because it's really dramatic. Um, oh, right. Okay. You'll no longer be able to shoulder the burden of fate 
that she was born into. What does that mean? That is crazy. Fate that she was born into. That is what it means to have her as part of your crew. And then says, I'm warning you in the dub. And so when he kicks Luffy, or when it looks like he kicks Luffy, in the dub, because he said, I'm warning you, it doesn't make any sense for him to warn him and then destroy him. So it doesn't work this moment of like, oh my God, did he do it? But in the in the subtitles, there's no sort of like sentence like that. It's just a quick jump that really does make it look like he just broke Luffy into a million pieces. And he says... It would be really, really easy for me to kill you right now, but I owe you one. Consider us even for you taking care of Crocodile and also, and again, him sort of, well, uh, something with Smoker also. Uh, see you around. And he walks away so that Sanji and um, Zoro find Luffy all frozen up I do like at one point he says oh he's all in one piece and I was like get it and then we have this moment where um, Aokiji is looking at his map and he's like looking at where they're headed next and he says oh my they are getting a lot closer to our headquarters again what is the problem with that like what could, why, what are you so worried about them getting near to your head? What is that about? So long story short, as I've like pretty much run out of time, um, there's a bit of a wait, but then we have Chopper coming out of the uh, bathroom and telling them that their hearts have started beating and everything looks like it's okay. They start to try and rush in. And Chopper has to become the big version of himself and, like, hold them back. And thankfully, we have a moment of Sanji calling him doctor, which do this causes Chopper to do that thing that I fucking love, which is when his arms become all wavy because he's so happy and excited. And he says, it doesn't make me happy at all when you call me a doctor, you big jerk. And... I live for these moments for Chopper. This is my favorite. When he gets to just like delight in everybody telling them that he did a good job. It's just so, it's the best. It's the best. And it happens twice because later Nico says something. I keep doing Nico. Robin says something to him that is similarly like, thank you for saving me, doctor. And he just like completely melts down and it's the best. Um, so Zoro is sort of like, all right, well, are we going to head out now? And Nami says, well, we have the log pose. We know where we're going next, but we do need to uh, like stay and get our shit together a little bit because of all the excitement. And Usopp, for his part, is sort of having an existential crisis. He's like, are we going to just have guys of this power level coming at us from now on? Because I cannot handle it. You saw how I just totally froze up out there. Oh, I did it again. I'm so sorry. And I'm not going to be useful. This is not like I, I, I don't know what I'll do. And Zoro just tells him, you're overtired. You're just exhausted. Go have a nap. Get some rest. And... There was something about that that I really appreciated. I thought Zoro was going to be kind of like, we'll stop being such a fucking coward. And instead, he's just, hey, man, you're being pretty hard on yourself. And honestly, it is so true that sometimes when I start to get into my head like this, it is I am just really tired and I need to rest. And that can look like all kinds of things, actually sleeping or just sitting and like, you know, chilling out for a bit. Um, but 
we find out that they uh, anchored there for four days, according to Luffy's or sorry, Nami's little log. And then we set out again and the weather was lovely. And it takes a while before. uh, Let's see. I'm trying to find the spot here. Oh, right. God, fucking Sanji and Zoro are never going to get along. And I mean, that's part of the joke, but I, I would like to see them agree on something at some point, just someday. Um, Sanji makes Nami this like potato paella. paella. I keep wanting to say paella because that's what it sort of sounds like he's saying, but it's not that word. And they're all like very distracted in the middle of eating and enjoying their day. It's been super chill. And then all of a sudden, Zoro looks up and spots the fucking frog doing the front crawl. And he is like, guys, guys, this thing is coming at us. And this frog is truly hideous. Like, I don't know what he he almost has like a sort of monkeyish face. Uh, and this dude comes at them just as Sanji is coming out with like cups of tea for Nami and Robin. And I got so agitated that he had just made them these nice cups of tea and the tea cups were about to get broken all over the place. No, he manages to save the tea cups. You guys, I know that this is not something that should be a priority for me. It really was, though. It mattered. And he saves them and holds them in the right spot so that it doesn't. And I was just like, see, Sanji's the real MVP. He really is. Holds it together. Appreciate it. So Nami's like, there's a fucking lighthouse out here. I don't understand. It doesn't look like we're anywhere near land. What is happening? And that's where the frog appears appears to be heading is like toward the lighthouse. And then... They hear a train horn sound. And Nami is again just like all the way out here. What? How is that possible? And everything sort of shakes. The ship seems like it has like run aground. And there's in the distance what almost looks like a stand like a, a, a this kind of stand that you would have like at an arena where you're going to go watch the Super Bowl or like a huge outdoor concert, you know, and this sound, we eventually see like the smoke coming up from this steam engine and the frog off to the background looking quite menacing and it just ends. And I have no idea what to make out of any of this. This combination of things is absolutely baffling to me. I don't, I have no clue. So yeah, that is where it ends. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up there, but I am really excited to see what's going on with this train, a uh, sea train. I mean, I wouldn't be mad about it, but it is weird. Uh, All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for hanging out and for listening. Thank you again to Florian for commissioning this one. And I'll be seeing you guys again. Let's see when. Um, Thursday, October 6th, the week from today, with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers.